well, for those of you who don't know me, and I think most of you do, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is Barbara Brummer. I'm the state director here in New Jersey, and I'm really happy that you could all join us today. Um, I am pleased, very pleased that Matt Brown is here to talk about TNC's work with wildlife in Africa. Matt is the Africa Regional Director and he leads more than 100 staffers that are working on behalf of nine African countries. So prior to becoming the Regional Director, Matt spent 11 years as the Conservation Director in Africa uh, and he developed and oversaw TNC's African conservation projects and he worked closely with existing local partners. In total, Matt has been with the Nature Conservancy for more than 13 years. And his love for Africa actually started as a Peace Corps forestry volunteer in Northern Ghana. Uh, he also had a stint uh, with the United Nations in Eritrea. Uh, he lived in Tanzania for eight years and he has a really uncanny ability to work with individuals, governments, and local communities and, and just make it look easy. So his bachelor's degree uh, is from Colby College and his master's uh, is from the School of Public and Environmental Affairs at Indiana University. Please help me welcome Matt Brown. Welcome Matt. Thanks, Barbara. Appreciate that warm welcome. Thank you all for coming inside. It sounds like a nice day in New Jersey. Um, so thanks for coming inside and parking yourselves in front of your screen here. Um, we're all eager to get off of Zoom and get back to face-to-face -face meetings. But in the meantime, I appreciate the audience and I appreciate the interest in, in Africa. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Barbara and team for hosting us today. Um, my colleague with the Africa region, Nancy Light, is on the, on the call as well, and she's going to help me with these slides here. Um, so yeah, we have, a, we have a really interesting set of programs in Africa. Um, let me go to the next slide here. Um, this is a map highlighting the countries where we are currently registered and where we have staff. And there are nine countries. The one that's not visible is the Seychelles, um, which is just north of Madagascar up there. Yeah, um, not visible only because there's 115 islands, but they're all small islands. Um, so when you color it in, it doesn't really show. Um, today, we're gonna talk about Kenya, uh, but we work in Kenya, Tanzania, Zambia, South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Gabon, and, and Seychelles. We are also doing some projects in the Republic of Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, different country, um, both around forest protection. Um, we're exploring some work again in Mozambique. We've worked there in the past. And then we're doing some projects in Ethiopia, in Senegal, Sierra Leone, um, and Malawi. Um, so, you know, for the most part, we're, we're pretty focused on East and Southern Africa. We're starting to move a little bit into Central Africa. And um, all of these locations were driven by a science priority setting process that, um, that we did when we first started work on the continent back in 2007. Um, so it's a good, good program. You know, we're one organization. So our mission, just like yours in New Jersey for TNC, is to protect the lands and waters upon which all life depends. Um, we do that by protecting, transforming, and inspiring, and we are committed to the 2030 goals, which I'm sure you all are too, um, and so there's a big focus on protection of healthy land, water, ocean, and then a huge focus on really addressing our climate change issues and trying to sequester more carbon um, through uh, new offtake initiatives like some uh, aggressive tree planting and then also trying to protect our standing forests uh, to avoid the loss of what is critical habitat but also critical carbon stores today. So climate and protection really drive a lot of our agenda across the Nature Conservancy. Um, the, the graphics on the right side of this screen are um, circles with uh, 10 or 
I guess it's 10 initially and then five, anyway, multiple year increments um, showing the increase in our impact, um, looking at acres that are better managed, um, looking at fresh water and marine and then people benefiting. And we collect a whole lot of metrics obviously, but um, we, um, we, we're making some fantastic progress. Um, and there's a lot of work I could talk about. Today, we're gonna focus just on, on Kenya. Uh, as Barbara mentioned, we are, um, we're we actually now, Barbara, about 110 staff. Uh, we have 13 different nationalities represented in the Africa region. So it's quite a strongly and fun, diverse group of people. Um, when we get together on full team Zoom calls or in person, um, there's a whole lot of, we usually have a, a cultural night where people wear uh, dress from, from their heritage and it's, it's really rich, it's, uh, it's fun. Um, so it's a great group of people. Um, we have a great group of partners as well. Uh, we're starting to really work with national government. So we're kind of moving beyond the startup and prove ourselves phase to actually being really transformative. Kenya is one of those countries and I'll talk about that here in a minute, but um, I'm quite proud of what we've achieved and, and where we are um, as a program. And, and um, I think our growth has been smart and good. And um, we don't aspire to be across all 54 countries. Uh, I think we're pretty set with where we are for now. And so we're really focused on the best chances to protect carbon and to protect critical habitat um, by including people um, in those solutions. So Nancy, can we go to the next slide? So we're gonna talk about Kenya. Um, this is the reticulated giraffe and some common uh, zebra. We also have Grevy zebra. Uh, the reticulateds are actually endemic to this to central Kenya, central northern Kenya. Um, Kenya has taken the COVID pandemic very seriously. They're one of two countries in Africa who has used uh, national dollars, treasury dollars, to pay wildlife rangers. Um, that is significant because wildlife based ecotourism is the second highest income earner toward GDP in the country. And so Kenya has recognized that and they are strengthening and maintaining during this tough time. They've also increased penalties for uh, wildlife crimes. So 2020, last year in Kenya, for the first year ever that people can remember, there was zero elephants poached for ivory and there were zero rhino poached for their horn. That's pretty significant. I mean, South Africa is still losing a lot of rhino. Um, and in a lot of other countries, we've actually seen poaching go up as a result of the pandemic with less tourism, less dollars, people are unemployed. You know, the, the, the need to kind of um, put food on the table and, and do a wildlife crime is, is higher. But in Kenya, because of the penalties being increased and because of the support from government to help keep people employed, um, they've avoided that. And it's, it's pretty significant. Um, so we take that as a good sign. Can you go to the next slide, Nancy? So these two maps are of the same area. The one on the left um, is from the early 90s, the mid 90s. The one on the right is from today. And the major difference that I hope jumps out at you is that there are um, community wildlife conservancies shaded in, in green on the map of the right. And so the Nature Conservancy, working with a partner of ours, one of our key partners, a group called the Northern Rangelands Trust, and that's their logo there with the oryx um, in yellow. Northern Rangelands Trust is an, um, an umbrella organization that now supports 39 community wildlife conservancies across 11 million acres of land in Northern Kenya. Half a million people living in these community conservancies, and these are critical lands for wildlife, um, for elephant, for giraffe, uh, for all the zebra, all the undulates, um, all the predators moving across. And there's a lot of cattle because these are pastoral people who herd sheep, goats, um, and, and cows. It's too dry to farm here. Um, and so what, what we've done um, with you know, TNC and the Northern Regions Trust, what we've done is help to expand the conservation footprint really to protect the most critical movement corridors for wildlife. So 60% of the wildlife in East Africa live or disperse outside of formal protected areas, outside of either private reserves like the Lewa Wildlife Conservancy, 
which is actually on this map, but we'll show you a better map in a minute, um, or outside of national parks or forest reserves. So these are lands where people are raising cattle and where there's a fair amount of uh, competition for, for grass and, and for water. So what we've tried to do here is to, to help local communities to get better benefit from wildlife. And the sort of take home story is that elephants are worth more alive than dead to local people. So we've, we've transformed a landscape here where there was a lot of poaching into a landscape where um, thanks to ecotourism and thanks to carbon payments and thanks to other conservation investments um, and development programs, people are some of the best advocates for wildlife and they identify when poaching activity may be happening. They're the best front line of defense. Um, their grass condition is better. They have better access to market. They have better health care. They have better schooling, all, are, all as a result of their commitment to help support um, conservation. And so really, it's been a mindset shift and a true behavior change by empowering and working with local communities to be part of the, the solution. And that's what's represented on this map on the right, with this huge area um, of community-based based conservancies. Um, so before we leave this map, the, the the landscape that we're focused in, um, and sorry, Barbara, I don't have a good analogy for the New Jersey program, but I'm sure there's some, you know, landscape that you all are focused in in New Jersey. For us in Kenya, this is a large one. This is 15 million acres, and it really goes from Mount Kenya here in the south. That dark green is the Mount Kenya National Park, and the light green surrounding it is the National Forest. It goes from Mount Kenya all the way north up to Marsabit National Park, which is that little dark green dot, um, and then some, some forest around there. And so elephants disperse in the, in the peak of the dry season, they go north up to Marsabit and south to Mount Kenya. And then during the wet season, when there's good grass, they, they come back into the center area. Um, so 15 million acre landscape, and we basically have just like we do in the United States with private lands, piece by piece by piece by piece, we've been filling in this footprint. Um, and there's more to go. Um, also on this map on the right, the dark green on the right of Mount Kenya, um, that's called Meru National Park. And elephants move from Meru up into Baliko Balesa there, up into the, the green conservancy area. So we're gonna fill in that tan area um, by creating new community conservancies there. Um, so really, so Matt, if if you want to look at New Jersey, the only area that I would say even comes even close is our Pine Barrens or about 1.1 million acres of um, uh, pine areas. So nice, but nothing really to compare with Africa. <laughs> yeah, but good example. So in the Pine Barrens, I'm sure the Nature Conservancy Science team has defined what success looks like, what the key threats are, and therefore you guys have some strong protection strategies to, to bring it all together, to have a functioning landscape that is you know, durable to changes and pressures over time and, and hopefully resilient to, to climate change as best we can. And, and that's the same approach that we're going to take in Africa. So I'll, I'll throw something else in there. Um, in New Jersey, we use uh, something we call Bobcat Alley, mm. which is a stretch of land that connects uh, resilient lands between one of our highlands and the Appalachian Mountains. And so uh, my marketing director just sent me a note and said, that sounds like Elephant Alley to me. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. Elephant yeah, you know, it's interesting. Wildlife corridors are a little bit hard for us to talk about uh, with local communities. Um, only because there is a history in some of these communities of people being moved. Um, and so we tend to talk about, you know, more actually livestock corridors. And if it stays open for livestock, then it also stays open for, for elephants. But, um, but this, this landscape's a little bit different where people truly do appreciate um, the elephants and, and the, uh, uh, the coexistence between people and nature. So let's go to the next slide here, Nancy. So in Kenya, uh, there are three land use types in simple form. There are public lands, parks, forests, there's community land, and there is private land. The community land, the Nature Conservancy helped to create um, a, new, a new piece of policy, a new uh, piece of legislation that recognizes a community wildlife conservancy as a legal ownership by a collective group of people, the community. Um, they have to have bylaws, they have to have a, 
a board, a governing board. They have to have an annual general meeting. Um, they have to have a management plan, but they submit all that to the Ministry of Lands. And then if all approved, they get a certificate, which is actually a really important document, which enables them to then enforce the, the land use plans and the bylaws that they've written as a community. Um, so a really good kind of high level policy change that then unlocks significant uh, opportunity. And today there are 160 conservancies in Kenya, some private, some community. Um, but eight years ago, there were zero legal um, conservancies in Kenya. So it's quite a movement. 11% uh, of the country is in conservancy status now. Um, so it's been a real shift and really exciting. And we're pushing forward with the government to help get to 30% protected. Um, and if you include the parks and everything else, there's 9% that has to be additional. And those will all be community wildlife conservancies um, in our discussions with government. So TNC is working at a national level um, and we're working at the kind of household grassroots level at the same time. Um, so private land is a piece of our portfolio. And if you can go to the next slide, Nancy. Um, you know, a lot of the private land uh, was traditionally owned by individual Kenyan families, often white Kenyan families. Um, and what we are trying to do is to transition those lands so that they are assets to the community. And we are doing that by creating a community trust, much like a land trust, I would think, in New Jersey, where that land access to grass for cattle, jobs, benefits, is a, and schools and health clinics are all provided by that private um, wildlife-based uh, piece of land. Whereas previously, it was basically just a private uh, family or a private company, and it was cattle, and it was just managing for profit. So we're transitioning the critical private lands that are part of the, the ecological movement corridors, um, the Bobcat Alley. You know, we're, we're, we're migrating the private lands in, in, in Elephant Alley to be part of the, the critical composition and then to be durable and relevant to local communities. Um, so that's one of the key agendas. Nancy, you can go to the next slide. And then obviously they're critical for wildlife too. And so we use the first filter is where are the most critical lands for biodiversity? And then the second filter is how do we transition ownership and management such that they are part of a bigger, really intersectional or multi-objective footprint in, in, this, in this landscape, um, meaning providing value to, to communities. So Nancy, let's go to the next slide. Um, actually, go back one slide, I'm sorry. So this picture, um, these are uh, black rhino here in this picture. Um, there are white rhino and there are black rhino. You can see the rhino on the right side of the picture. You can see it's almost a pointed lip. Um, that means that it's a black rhino because black rhinos browse leaves off of bushes, whereas white rhinos have a really wide mouth and they actually graze like a cow or like a, like a zebra. Um, so these are black rhinos. And if you can go to the next slide, um, we have an interesting project where we are working with the Kenya Wildlife Service, the government um, Department of National Parks uh, and Wildlife, basically the Kenya Wildlife Service, to introduce 20 black, reintroduce 20 black rhino to this property in the top of the right slide called Boisaba, um, which the Nature Conservancy raised funds uh, to acquire the 60,000 acres at 150 bucks an acre, so $9 million. Uh, we transitioned ownership from a private Italian family who ran it as a cattle ranch to the Loisaba Community Trust. And we registered it as a, as a wildlife conservancy in Kenya. And we've improved security. We've graded all the roads. We've brought in a strong ecotourism partner. We put a formal board in place. Uh, we have three Kenyan trustees as the trustees of a trust that we created. Um, we've really improved the habitat condition and the wildlife abundance. And now the last sort of um, effort that we, we want to do here is to reintroduce black rhino. Black rhino were at Loisaba 50 years ago, and the last rhino was poached out around 50 years ago for the horn. Um, and so we're working with the government and as part of their national plan to find more habitat for black rhino. And so we're gonna reintroduce a year from now, next March, uh, 20 individuals. They'll come from different parts of the country so that we have a diverse gene pool. 
those 20 will be in a fenced area to start, and then they will breed up to about 100 individuals. Um, and if you look at this map on the, let's look at the map on the left. So these are the critical private lands kind of in dark green and in that hatched red circle. We're also work, Lewis on the right there, um, Barana, we work with all these uh, private conservancies. But the, the, the darker green area behind it is where it's private land that is, most of them now are managed for conservation, not all, but we've been working hard to transition those. And then the lands to the north, the, the kind of middle green there, that big area, those are all the community lands, the community wildlife conservancies. And so again, think of Bobcat Alley. What we're trying to do is ensure that elephants can move from the private lands in the south up to the communal lands during the peak of the wet season. And then when it gets really dry and resources get scarce, then the elephants, giraffe, uh, move south again back into some of these private lands where there's really good grass condition and grass cover. All these places are either unfenced or if they're fenced, there are gaps in the fence to allow wildlife to, to move in and out. So we're trying to build you know, a functioning, rebuild or restore, frankly, a functioning landscape for people and for wildlife here in Northern Kenya. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Nancy. So here's some quick figures on the slide. Kenya's black rhino, and these are the Eastern black rhino. Kenya's Eastern black rhino population was around 20,000. It got to a low of around 400 due to poaching um, really in the late eighties. Um, and today it's, it's about 850 um, individuals, which is good. Um, their goal is to get to 2000. Um, the main strategy is to open up more habitat. So by creating more habitat at Loisaba and the Nature Conservancy raising the funds to enable this to happen um, and working really closely with government, we are helping the government with its uh, species um, program for the Eastern Black Rhino. So if you can go to the next slide. So this is just a fun uh, picture of some young um, calves who are being bottle fed. Um, there's actually a number of, of uh, mothers who have been poached. And so actually there's a ranger program that, that really walks with these rhinos, the baby rhinos every day, and they're all bottle fed. Um, you know, rhino, all rhino have really poor eyesight. And so when they're young in particular, they need stewardship um, pretty much 24 hours a day. If you come to Lewa or come to Loisaba, you can, you can see young rhino like this. Go to the next slide. So here's a classic picture of, uh, um, of a rhino at Lewa Wildlife Conservancy. I mean, look at the size of both of those horns. Um, this one is highly prized. Um, and we will have questions here in a minute. I mean, you guys might wonder, you know, why don't they cut the horns off? Well, in South Africa, they generally do, where the poaching is a lot higher. Um, it's, it's an okay strategy. It's kind of a last resort because rhino do use their horns just like elephants use their tusks um, in the mating process. And as males are competing for females, they can use the horns to um, jockey for position basically. Um, so, you know, the purists, the pure conservationists say really it should be a last resort. Obviously we'd rather have rhino alive than poached, but you'd, re you'd really wanna have rhino alive with their horns on. Um, and there's a lot of other techniques that are out there. Nancy, can we go to the next slide? So I think this is my last slide. Um, this is a friend of mine. This is a guy named Lucky, uh, whose father uh, worked at Loisaba and Lucky now works at Loisaba. He's a ranger. Um, I was on a walk with Lucky about, oh, it was just before COVID. So it was last February, I guess. And it was early in the morning. The sun was just coming up. It was just a couple of us out walking. And Lucky's got a, you know, a rifle and he's looking across the landscape, looking for anything all the time. Um, and he speaks Swahili, a um, little bit of English, but mostly Swahili. Um, but he stopped at one point and pointed to the ground and he starts moving the long grass with his foot. And there was a skull on the ground and the skull was old and kind of, you know, decomposing a little bit. Um, but he told me it was a rhino skull. And he doesn't remember rhino because he's not old enough, but he, he knows that his dad talks about having rhino at Loisaba. And here's a guy whose entire family and his whole presence has been around wildlife and wildlife protection. And he you know, said really compellingly, 
Um, and I have very broken Swahili, so I'm sure I sort of heard what I wanted to hear, but he basically was like, we need to bring the rhino back. Like we need to have them return uh, to Loisaba. And, um, you know, I think, I think rhino is a draw for tourism, yes, but there is also a lot of pride locally about restoring a species that was once there and has now vanished and bringing back the land to the holistic state that it was originally. Um, so there's a lot of good support for what, what we're doing. And I think it's a pretty significant um, project because it, it's part of this bigger landscape, you know, that I talked about, but this single project is really interesting and it'll be high profile for TNC to do this with the, with the Kenyan government. So I believe that's the last slide, Nancy. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so listen, you know, our, our work in Africa is diverse. We're doing a lot of work on ocean protection. We're doing some really interesting freshwater work. Um, there's a whole lot we can talk about. Um, I've learned to kind of focus a little bit on uh, a project or two. And so this is a, a key landscape for us in Northern Kenya, um, but happy to field questions on any, anything else in Africa, um, anything about Kenya uh, or about this, this project to reintroduce black rhino in, in particular. Um, so Barbara, thanks for having me. And I think we're opening it up now for questions. Um, yes, we, do. we, we yeah. do have a few questions and folks just type your questions right into the chat at the bottom of your screen. Um, Matt, in 2020, there were 394 rhino poached in South Africa and none poached in Kenya. So what accounts for the difference? Yeah, that's a great question. The, um, there's a couple of reasons for it. The first is that the penalties are significantly higher in Kenya and they weren't always um, severe. I mean, now there's a $100,000 fine. Um, if you're actually caught um, and if there's any gunfire exchange, it can't even be life imprisonment. Um, and so very strong um, prosecution penalties in, in the country of Kenya. Secondly, the really the unlocking of communities where communities are part of the solution and communities really do benefit from conservation. You know, if you get a whole community around you, around a protected area that has rhino, and that community sees that rhino as an asset to them. I mean, everybody knows who the poachers are. Everybody knows when a strange guy shows up in a new vehicle that hasn't been in that community before. Um, you know, so you've got informants everywhere, effectively, um, and really unlocking the community to be the front line of defense is the strongest um, when possible. Some of the difference with South Africa, because there's obviously community conservation in South Africa as well, but a lot of the poaching happens on these private game farms in South Africa um, that are sometimes fenced, uh, most often fenced, I guess, if they're game farms. But the business model there is you have a big piece of land, you build up wildlife and then you invite people to come in and pay to, to hunt and the hunting is sustainable. Um, but it's pretty easy for a poacher to figure out when the rangers are shifting and you know you target those animals and then you can get the horn of the tusks out pretty easily. Um, so it's really those two things. I mean the, the big thing for Africa is that the price of ivory has gone down because China has closed its markets. But that wouldn't explain why South Africa is different than Kenya. So across the board we're seeing less poaching than we did at the peak, which was really in the, um, you know, really kind of mid 80s to even early 90s, it was really severe. Um, and then again, around 2013. Um, but but that unlocking the community support, which is what we've done with these conservancies is, is one of the key answers. Okay. Um, and could you talk a little bit more about how community conservation works? And might it be a model for current consideration of giving lands back to Native American tribes here in the US? Yeah, uh, also a great question. I think there is a lot of opportunity to do that. Um, the, and we're working closely with the TNC Global Strategy. Uh, we have a strategy on indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, so a little bit technical here, we, our strategy has a three phased approach to it. So the theory of change is effectively if, well, so let me back up. The real problem is it's the tragedy of the commons. It's like a fishery where, because nobody owns the resource, no one owns the land, no one owns the fishery. 
if I, you know, Don, if you fish less, it just means I'm going to fish more. Um, so you, there's no incentive for you to better manage the fishery or better manage the grass, um, because if you fish less or graze less cattle, then, you know, Matt is just going to have, have better access. Um, so how do you change that? So this is Eleanor Ostrom and a lot of her principles around community governance, and it, it really focuses on ownership. So we've sort of adapted Eleanor Ostrom's uh, work, um, who taught at IU, where I got my graduate degree, um, to, to think about three things. One, we are getting ownership for the community. So hence that community conservancy model and hence our focus on working with Ministry of Lands to change national policy. Um, with fisheries in Tanzania and in Kenya, we're doing the same thing. We we're doing the structure and the government work to get communities to actually own their beachfront and own access to their fishery. Um, so ownership is step one. Step two is do they have the right technical capacity to better manage those lands or those fisheries? And a lot of that has to do with data collection and you know, using remote sensing to look at the health of grass condition and best practices with animal husbandry. And I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And that's really the role of an NGO, right, is to provide that technical support. And then third, they need to see sustained and increased benefit, not always money, but benefit, often grass, um, from a resource that they own and they better manage. And if they own it, and if it's being better managed, and if they're seeing positive increased benefit, then there, there is incentive to keep managing it positively so that that benefit continues. And then you put in governance structures with bylaws and penalties. I mean, if someone's grazing their, their herd in the wrong place at the wrong time, you know, they have to pay a fine. And so it's making sure you've got the right governance where people are actually enforced and penalized and they have to follow through on that. Um, so that's the basic structure. And um, I think it is highly replicable across countries in Africa. I think it's highly replicable. I mean, we've hosted our Mongolia team and shared a lot of this with them. Um, a lot of the work with Native Americans in the U.S. Um, I think could could follow the same structure. Um, there's a lot of privatized land in the U.S., so it's a little bit hard. I mean, in, in a lot of African countries, there are still big areas of land that are um, managed by communities informally, and so all we're doing is strengthening and and recognizing their legal ownership. Um, so maybe the issues are a little bit different in terms of land, but in terms of approach, yes, I think it could could apply directly to Native Americans in this country. So we've made great progress in Kenya, but how can we replicate that in other countries? Well, we're making great progress in other countries too. Uh, of course, I have to say that, um, but we are making good progress. Um, in Tanzania, we're working in an 8 million acre landscape using Terengiri and the Ngorogoro Conservation Area um, as the Critic and Minyara National Park is the critical protected areas, and it's the same idea. You know, we're doing village-based conservation. We're looking at livestock markets. We're securing critical movement corridors for wildlife, um, and we're trying to make sure that there there is agriculture. It's a little bit wetter, but where agriculture happens, um, it's the right place for it to happen rather than the wrong place, right? And we're trying to. We are working with local communities to help protect the, the critical. Uh, elephant alley, if you will, the elephant corridors. Um, Zambia, uh, we're doing a fair amount of work in one of the, actually the place on earth that has the highest diversity of antelope of anywhere in the world. It's Kafui National Park. The park itself is five and a half million acres. And we're working with the communities around Kafui, which is an additional 9.6 million acres. So over 16 million acre protected area complex. And, um, we are working with our Arkansas chapter to do fire management in that ecosystem. We've been funding a lot of wildlife security and patrols. And now we have two big awards from uh, bilateral funding partners to really invest in the communities and roll out a strong community conservation model um, where communities benefit and have long-term ownership and stake um, in, in the conservation asset, basically. Um, so I could say more about all those projects, but you know, we are, we're, we're learning and replicating it. And a key question always when we start a new project is, is this just a one-off project or does it have replication potential? Will there be some lessons that we think we can harness to advance another project? And another way to answer that question is that we work with partners everywhere. And so we're, we are always bringing people to Northern Kenya to look at these community wildlife conservancies 
just to get the juices flowing and to have some comparative analysis and they can come back to their communities and, and you know, talk about it um, with the leaders, with the women, with the youth and say what, what could be applicable to us and why. Um, so we're doing a lot of, we call them study tours, a lot of exchange tours. Matt, can you talk a little bit more about the impact of COVID-19 on conservation and also on the wildlife in Africa? Yeah, I mean, I'm saying COVID's had a big impact, negative impact. Um, the biggest impact is just that the travel has stopped and there was no chance to plan. So in all these countries that depend on wildlife tourism, um, you know, March 1st, people were still coming by March 15th that had dropped to near zero and it's been near zero now for 13 months and it'll, we're starting to see a little bit of activity in some places, but it's, it's, you know, it's 10% of what it was in, in 2019. 2019 was a great year. Everyone forecasted 2020 was going to be an even better year and then COVID hit. So that's really hard when you run a business, whether it's a community conservancy, a national park, or a private wildlife reserve to have your revenue, like Loisaba where we're bringing the rhino back, for example. Um, in 2019, they earned $600,000 from, um, from tourism. Uh, there's 42 beds there. Um, they operate at a pretty high occupancy and there's um, foreign rates and then domestic rates, but they earned, um, uh, they earned to the conservancy uh, so there's about $105 a person a night bed fee, and there's some variation on that, but they earn $600,000 uh, from tourism. This year, zero. And that's hard when your costs are fixed. You know, um, the guy that drives the security vehicle, um, the, and so a lot of staff got laid off in the lodges and in the tourism um, sector. And so the impact of that is that um, some of these conservation areas are not as well protected as they were pre-COVID, and then people who live in the community are out of work and are desperate and are looking for other ways to feed their families. So maybe they're producing charcoal illegally. Maybe they're felling timber and selling it illegally. Maybe they're involved in some bush meat snaring um, or in some direct killing of, of you know, high value wildlife. For, for um, In Tanzania and Zambia, we've seen a lot of, a lot of poaching go up, for example. Um, so it's had, a, it's had a big impact, and um, I could talk for a minute about some of the responses that we've had as TNC, if you're interested, but, but in short, the impact has been pretty acute, and it's acute, you know, for all business sectors, really. I mean, even today, there's a, you can't travel into Nairobi, and there's a curfew, and it, it makes it hard to attract foreign investment, um, so um, COVID's had a, had a big impact, and these governments don't have the ability to do a $2.3 trillion stimulus package like the US government does. Um, and there's uh, not as great access to healthcare, um, so. Okay, we had a couple of questions about the fencing in the Rhino Sanctuary, so I'm gonna combine them into one. Uh, the first part, um, understanding that they need to be uh, fenced in order to keep the Rhino safe, does that, how does that impact other wildlife? And also, once they're out of the fenced-in protected area, will the migro then um, rhino then migrate to follow the grasses on the Serengeti, and will they be protected in Tanzania like they are in Kenya? Yeah, great, great question. So, the fencing is designed to keep rhino in, and then also to allow other all the other species to move. And so, the way that works is um, there is a it's a low a uh, wire fence with three strands, and then it has what we call outriggers, so a, a strong piece of wire that um, that sticks straight out. And so when the rhino comes against it, it basically hits their chest and they have to turn around. And then there are breaks in the fence for every all the other species to move in and out. In those breaks, um, we build a rock wall, a, a pretty low rock wall, um, I mean, maybe two feet high and a little bit wide. And rhinos don't like to walk over things like that, but also because their legs are so short, their bellies get caught and they get high centered. And so they basically don't walk through those, but all the antelope, elephants, giraffe, um, all your small mammals can just climb right over that. And even the other fence, 
you know, you see kudu jumping right over the other fence because it's pretty low. So it's a, it's a fence specifically designed for this one animal, you know, for rhino to keep them in. Um, there are not a lot of free ranging, the so second question, there are not a lot of free ranging rhino today anywhere um, in Africa. Uh, rhino have been released, there's been four rhino released into Serengeti National Park and, um, or maybe six, I think there were six. I think two were killed, unfortunately. Um, and they move around and the rangers know where they are. Um, sometimes we put chips on them. Um, the rangers are always pretty aware of where those animals are, but there aren't just rhino. That would be a wonderful thing someday to have rhino kind of moving around all over, but that's, that's not the case today. So most rhino are in, um, except for Serengeti, they're in area in the Kamazi National Park. They're in areas that are, that are fenced uh, to keep them in. Okay, um, you mentioned women uh, when you talked about the study tours. What have you learned about the importance of women to community conservation? Women are where the investment needs to happen. I mean, women are the ones who get everything done in the communities. Women have proven to be um, much better investments from mi micro lending and microfinance perspective. Women inherently work together more than, than men do. Um, particularly in some of these East African cultures. Um, and the women really are the ones who, you know, care for the children. And so they're they are aware of what school fees are and what medical bills are. Um, and so they, they really manage the household. And there's been a lot of example of when women have access to income, how the whole household and therefore the whole community really does better. Um, and there's evidence that when men get access to the money, that doesn't happen. Um, and so women are increasingly, and a lot of this is like no brainer, right? Like it makes perfect sense, but, but there's been, there's been a real, uh, change in all the development organizations. Um, and even in a lot of the Kenyan government where there are requirements now that women representation happen on all the governing boards at national level, at community level, um, and that a lot of the development work is really targeting, uh, women, um, TNC Africa has a, a group of supporters uh, that we call an affinity group for women and girls. And we do about uh, $2.6 million of work that directly supports women and girls every year across our portfolio of <clears throat> programs in Africa. And uh, one of our latest projects is to build a girls dormitory um, at a secondary school in one of our key landscape projects in Tanzania. Um, so it's a school called Lagosa and this 80 bed girls dormitory um, has helped girls finish school and has helped them maintain high grades and then has helped them go on to secondary or to higher education once they finish secondary school. Um, without a dormitory, a lot of girls have to walk far to school. Um, when they get home, they have to help with chores and there's a much higher dropout rate for girls than for boys. Um, and we've seen a, a pretty exponential uptick in the amount of female graduates um, because of that type of effort. And that's a small project in one place, but across the board, we're trying to pay a lot more attention to work with reproductive health partners and to work with um, the women in the communities where we are um, and really channel a lot of our investment to them. Okay, thanks, Matt. That's it for the questions, but we do have a few minutes left. So Matt and Barbara, do you have anything you'd like to add? Well, I'm happy to just quickly talk about, our, we have three phased response to COVID that I think, I think you guys might be interested in. Um, so when COVID hit a year ago, we, we, we came up with three responses. The first response was to do a, what we call the crisis fund fundraise. So we, we raised um, some good money. I mean, over two and a half million dollars into a, it, that we then granted to our key partners who are managing community and private lands in Kenya, Tanzania, Zambia, and Namibia. We kept over 950 rangers employed. Um, we protected over 45 million acres of land. Um, and it's hard to calculate how many animals that would have died otherwise, because there's no real counterfactual in those areas. But I mean, it, it had a big impact on people and on nature. And the response from these partners was like, fantastic. And what we did is we asked all of them, what revenue were you hoping to get in the 2020 tourism season from 
wildlife-based tourism. And the total of that across these uh, roughly 15 areas that we supported was about $3 million. Um, and so we raised, uh, we raised 2.6 million toward that 3 million goal. And the partners were incredibly grateful for that support. We're actually just, we just launched a second round of that because COVID's now extending longer than we thought. The second thing we did is we designed an impact investment fund. Um, we partnered with a private investment manager. This is with our NatureVest team. We did this. Um, we have raised $20 million and we're about to raise another 10 more. So we're trying to put $30 million as very targeted loans, anywhere from three to 5 million each, um, to companies to en enable them, and we have strong conservation covenants in the loan agreement, to enable them to continue their community and their conservation impact. Because that is you know, a revenue stream that can turn over. And so it's basically stimulus to help them sustain and to help them rebound the minute that tourism comes back. Without that, a lot of these companies just close their doors, go into mothballs, fire everybody, or you know, lay them off. And then they just sit and wait until tourism comes back. Well, in the meantime, you know, there's a lot of pressure on the landscape and nothing going for people. So that's a stimulus package. And then the third response was, or is as always, how do we diversify revenue to conservation away from tourism? I mean, tourism will always be great, but how do we think about carbon? How do we think about debt swaps? How do we think about trust funds? How do we have a di more diversified revenue stream to support these critical areas? And so carbon financing has been a big play uh, for a lot of our work in, in Africa. And we're really focused on additionality, of course, um, and making sure that they are great projects. Um, but that's been a nice angle, which isn't, it doesn't go up and down with, with global pandemics. It's a, you know, every year there's good income coming in. So those are the three, uh, three responses. Well, it's wonderful to hear about all the wonderful things going on in Africa. Um, I, I know Matt, you as I am are always so proud of all the work we do around the world. And it's amazing to listen to what others are doing. We learn so much from each other. Uh, it's such a great way to learn. Um, if there are no other questions, um, I think I will sum this up by first of all, thanking Matt and uh, saying how much we appreciate uh, what you're doing. I wanna thank everyone who joined us today. We are deeply grateful for your support of our work. You are what make things happen. And I'm hoping that you'll plan to join us at our next uh, event that we're having, our next Conservation Connection event. And that's gonna be on the Belize Mayan forest, which is critical for nature and people. So that's going to happen on May 26th, again at 1 p.m. We hope you will all make time to join us. We love to um, see your faces and, and grow and learn with you. So I want to thank you again for all of your um, participation with us. And um, hopefully we'll all get back to a point in time where we're back to traveling again and we can actually go and see some of these places. I highly recommend trips to Africa. I've been there twice and I would go back many more times given the opportunity. So thank you again.